Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Praise Yahweh for another wonderful Shabbat. Very wet and cold here in Cape Town. But we thank our Master that we're all safe under His protection. And we can give Him praise that He's keeping us all healthy, warm and dry. Praise Him for that. So we are looking at Shemot and the design of the tabernacle, but we're now uh, getting into the materials that were to be brought for the tabernacle. So as we go through the next couple of weeks, wonderful lessons that we can learn on that which is brought uh, to build the tabernacle so that Yahweh can dwell with his people and the uh, wonderful lessons that we get in doing as prescribed according to the pattern. I think that's one of the key focuses that we're able to learn as we go through these Torah portions, teaching us a valuable lesson of sticking to the pattern, you know. So this week's Torah portion is from Shemot 25 through to 27, verse 19, and it's called Teruma, which means contribution. And I think uh, Ricardo is there. Is that right? Okay. Hey, Ricardo. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they take up a contribution for me. From everyone whose heart moves in, you shall take up my contribution. And this is the contribution which you take up from them, gold and silver and bronze blue and purple and scarlet material, fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and fine leather and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, show him stones and stones to be set in the shoulder garment and in the breastplate, and they shall make me a set-apart place, and I shall dwell in their midst. According to all that I show you, the pattern of the dwelling place and the pattern of all his furnishings, make it exactly so, and they shall make an ark of acacia wood, Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay it with clean gold, inside and outside you shall overlay it. And you shall make it on it a moulding of gold, gold all around. And you shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, to lift up the ark by them. The poles are in the rings of the ark, they are not taken from it. And into the ark you shall put the witness which I give you. And you shall make a lid of atonement of clean gold, two and a half cubits long and a uh, cubit and a half wide. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of beaten work, at the two ends of the lid of atonement. And make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. Make the cherubim from the lid of atonement at its two ends. And the cherubim shall be spreading out their wings above, covering the lid of atonement with their wings, with their faces toward each other. The faces of the cherubim turn toward the lid of atonement. And you shall put the lid of atonement on top of the ark, and put into the ark the witness which I give you. And I shall meet with you there, and from above the lid of atonement, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the witness, I shall speak to you all that which I command you concerning the children of Israel. And you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit, a, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. And you shall overlay it with clean gold, and shall make a moulding of gold all around. And shall make for it a rim of a hand bread all around, and shall make a gold moulding for the rim all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings are close to the rim, as holders for the poles to lift the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and the table shall be lifted with them. And you shall make its dishes, and its ladles, and its jars, and its bowls for pouring. Make them of clean gold. And you shall put the showbread on the table before me continually. And you shall make a lampstand of clean gold. The lampstand is made of beaten wood. Its base and its shaft, its cups, its ornamental knobs and blossoms are from it. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches are of the lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three cups made like almond flowers on one branch, with ornamental knob and blossom, and three cups made like almond flowers on the other branch, with ornamental knobs and blossom. So for the six branches coming out of the lampstand, and on the lampstand itself are four cups made like almond flowers, with ornamental knob and blossom. And a knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches are of the same, all of it one beaten work of clean gold. And you shall make seven lamps for it, 
and they shall mount its lamp so that they keep light in front of it. And its snuffers and its trays are, cle are, are clean gold. It is made of a talent of clean gold, with all these utensils. So see, and do according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Okay, so here we see a wonderful portion that begins teaching us valuable lessons on the design of the tabernacle and that which needed to be brought so that the tabernacle could be built according to Yahweh's perfect instructions that Moshe received on the mountain. So this Torah portion, Teruma, Teruma means contribution or offering or gift, and it's what's given or set aside as a special voluntary contribution either to a person, a deity, or a cause in worship. So we see this word giving clear meaning in it's either a whole or something of a part that's contributed toward a special service. So the Hebrew word teruma comes from the root word rum, which means to be high or exalted or lift up or raise up or contribute. And so when Yahweh spoke to Moshe, he told him that all Israel were to take up a contribution to Yahweh. And it was to be from everyone whose heart had moved them. And this is such a valuable lesson. There's so many things that we can learn here when we look at this Torah portion as we go through the materials, etc. Wonderful lessons on every single aspect of the tabernacle being a clear witness of the fullness of the work of Messiah in us as a body being joined and knit together by his perfect design, being built up as living stones. And so when we look at these instructions for this Torah portion giving us that which was to be brought for the tabernacle and its furnishings, we also see that there's a call here for a commitment to the contribution that was being given, you know, toward the building of this tabernacle. And the, the call was, it had to come from the heart. And that is a key in everything that we do towards our master. You know, the greatest commandment that we shall love Yahweh with all our heart and all our strength and all our being is a clear witness that if it doesn't begin in the heart, it won't continue. It will die. You know, and so we as his temple, as his dwelling place, you know, we are the dwelling place of our master, living stones being built up in him. We bring our lives as a contribution in offering up that which we have, not under compulsion, but rather as our hearts are moved to do that which is required of us in the body toward Yahweh. And Shaul reminds the believers in Corinth in his second letter in chapter 9, verse 7, we said, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not of grief or necessity, for Elohim loves a cheerful or joyous giver, whichever translation you prefer. In other words, when you are, mo when you are moved in your heart to serve Yahweh the way we should, it should always come from the basis of a heart. It's never something that's done without joy, you know, and without good cheer in one's life. It's, it really comes down to the heart of the matter. If, if one's heart is not truly seeking Yahweh and putting your all in, giving him your all because he gave you his, then you're just going to tire yourself out. You're going to grow weary. You're going to grow anxious and, and get tired of serving out of a duty rather than, I mean, there's duty required, but if it doesn't start from a place of willingness in the heart, that duty will become burdensome, you know? And so the Hebrew word that's translated as speak when, when Moshe, Moshe was told to speak to the children of Israel is daber, and it comes from devar, which is to speak, command, counsel, declare, and it's written in the intensive or intentional action tense highlighting that the, powers of, the power of these words that were spoken by Moshe or from Yahweh to Moshe to speak to the children of Israel were words that would cause hearts to move, to be moved, to obey as they should. And, and I think that's something that we can see as a valuable lesson every single week when we come together to hear what Moshe says, what the Torah says. It's words that should move our hearts to want to obey 
not want to find out how we don't need to obey, which a lot of people try and do. They listen to find a loophole in their reasoning, where when we hear the words of Moshe, the intensity that these words are given is the intensity in which they should be received to incite us to actually get up and be filled with joy to do what the word instructs us to do. You know, so everyone whose heart moves him was an invitation to be part of the building process. Two million plus people, they were given an invitation. You know, and this is such a wonderful thing here. You know, this was be part of the building for the esteem of Yahweh. Not for your own accolades, not for your own position and prominence and name. Look what I did. That's the world system. With Yahweh, there isn't pyramid schemes to try and get some positional pre uh, uh, um, preference over another and have a, you know, have a whole lot of people below you. It is about Yahweh. He's the one who's seated above. You know? And when we understand that these contributions that are being called for here to build the tabernacle, these were not the tithes that people were commanded to bring. This was something that was given over and above tithes. It's very important. A lot of people think, okay, I'll be very cheerful in giving a contribution, but they've neglected the weightier matters of obedience to putting Yahweh first in their tithes. So this is something that is given voluntarily and generously from the heart. And when one does that, when it, that's why Shaul was teaching Torah when he says that Yahweh loves a cheerful giver. Don't give under compulsion. And that doesn't mean that that's an excuse not to tithe. That's a command. So we have to understand what's going on here in this lesson of this Torah portion is that when something's done from the heart, there's a joy, there's an excitement of being a contributing member of that which is building up as a part of the whole. So giving with generosity from the heart implies a wonderful lesson for us that many seem to struggle with today. And that means it doesn't seek something in return, nor does it lay claim to having a say over what happens to that which has been given. Now, in fact, this is how tithes are also be to, are, are to be given, you know. It's, it's to be done cheerfully. It's to be done with a heart of this is to Yahweh because of what he's done for me, because putting first. This is the concept here. With Teruma, this is, a, this is an overflow. This is, a, 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 this is where now Israel had seen what Yahweh's done. He's equipped them in their hands with what's needed to be brought. Now there's the test to see whose hearts are really in it. Bring what's required, you know. And so giving from a scriptural perspective actually never stops. The, the ability and call to always be putting Yahweh first is, and, and contributing and being part of that building process is an open invitation. And what we learn from this, it's not just how you see fit. It's according to a pattern. There's a reason. There's a structure. There's a design. There's a purpose. You know, And so the Hebrew word that's translated as moves it comes from the root word nadav, which means to willingness or incite or desire to do something with Im the implication of an eagerness and a generosity or a free offering. It's, it's like, I'm just, I just want to do that. I'm not waiting for a specific point in time to be commanded to do something. I'm actually now, because of the call that's gone out, there's a building that's happening, I'm, I'm just spontaneous and I'm willingly contributing to that. That's the, the idea of having a heart that's moved. It's not being beaten and struck, oh, I have to do this, because as I said, when it's not from a heart of willingness, it will just become very burdensome, and then that's when the, the what are you doing with it? Why is it? What is it for? Why? I want to see. Give me a, a, an account. You know, that's what happens when people aren't doing it from a willingness that's moved by the Spirit of Yahweh in thankfulness for what He's delivered you from, you know, and so... We know that Nadav was the name of one of Aharon's sons and he brought strange fire as a great lesson for us of not having the right heart and see what happens when you don't have the right heart. The renewed writings is a wonderful lesson for us again with Hananya and Shapira who lied to the set-apart spirit and were struck because they didn't have the right heart. They wanted to look like they had the right heart and putting on a show before people. But while people can't see the heart, Yahweh does. You know, and what's important to take note here is that this kind of giving, this willingness, this 
voluntary, spontaneous willingness to give according to the design of our master elevates the giver to a greater level of intimacy and worship to the master. It's important to recognize that there's not one specific person who brings the whole thing. This is what's wonderful in this Torah portion. It teaches us that each one gives the portion that they are designed to based on what they have in their hands, you know, and what's purposed in their heart according to their own ability. It's such a powerful witness here. In these instructions that are given here, we take note that it's not just a giving of whatever one wants. It was a giving for a specific purpose, and that was for a place for Yahweh to dwell in their midst. And even before Yahweh mentioned what must be brought, he highlights that the state of the generous heart is a prerequisite for anything that must be brought. So it comes down to the heart of the matter. And as we know, you can look at the notes for a lot of pictures and pictographics, but the heart is a simple one to remember. In, the, in Hebrew, it's a, a lamet and a bait. And in the pictographic, the lamet is a shepherd's rod. It highlights authority. Uh, representing our master's authority and his commands, his rules, if you will. And the bait is a picture of a tent floor plan. We're beginning to look at the tabernacle and its design, highlighting for us who we are as a dwelling place in the master. So therefore, even in the pictographic, the, the, the Hebrew word for heart gives the meaning rules of the house. So therefore, we understand that he's now written his rules on our hearts. Therefore, we shouldn't be trying to find ways out of obedience, but rather our hearts should be willingly ready at all times to always obey and with that overflow with that joy to give to Yahweh what is due for the esteem of his name. And you know what? You can never outgive Yahweh. And so when we recognize it comes down to the heart of the matter, it's right through the, the writings, of the whole scripture keeps revealing to us Yahweh is always looking to the heart. Man might look at the eyes, which we know, but Yahweh looks at the heart. And this is, and I know I'm talking a lot about giving and some people get offended by it, but then look into your heart and see how are you receiving this message? Because when Yahweh is giving an instruction, there's commands and instructions that are always to be obeyed from a state of a heart that is wholeheartedly seeking him with their all, loving him with all the heart. You know, and so one thing that we have to ask ourselves when looking even at Torah portions like this, as we go through every element and we start seeing the design and it's and, you know, some people say, why do we have to learn about the tent and everything? And it's repeated. No, what we see is Yahweh gives Moshe instructions. Moshe gives the people instructions. And then we see the instructions being upheld according to that which was given. So it might sign up sound over the next couple of weeks that, hold on, we've done this already. No, it's for good reason, because it's always a mirror to us of what the word says, am I following it, am I applying it, according to that which has actually been instructed. And so it's a heart thing. So we always have to ask ourselves, how is my heart? Is it filled or defiled through sin and the deceit of lawlessness, always trying to cut corners and, you know, do what the world does in trying to, you know, find the easier route, you know? Or are we actually going the route less traveled? And when I say that, I mean the narrow way, the perfect way. When your heart's in it the way it should be, then our hearts are kept clean by the blood of Messiah and we will hear God and do everything that he's commanded us. We have ears that are ready to pay attention. We're not saying, okay, enough of that. Uh, I've heard that before. I don't need to hear it again. That's not a heart that hears and responds as one should. So in, in a cry of David, in repentance for his sins, he cried out to Yahweh to create in him a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within him. So when we want to walk in the spirit of Yahweh, it begins with a, a heart that's been cleansed, a cleansed heart that only Yahweh himself can create in us when we truly come to him and submit to the rules of the house. Amen. Our master, we went through the Beatitudes a couple of weeks ago, and he says that blessed are the clean in heart because they shall see Elohim. So when we're looking at this, Yahweh creates in us a clean heart in order to renew us to be steadfast in obeying his commands, which are good for his house to be built up for the splendor and esteem of his name and his name alone. Amen. And so... 
What we take note of here in this um, chapter that we've just begun, this Torah portion with, is that the contribution that's taken up is Yahweh's. And that's important for us to understand. It wasn't for Moshe or Aharon or for anyone else. The contribution was for Yahweh, and it was to be brought with a glad and rejoicing heart. And we know that while all these things were brought, it was used to facilitate the service of the tabernacle, equip the priests who served in it. We also realize that when giving becomes about a person rather than Elohim, then it's not done with the right heart and the right motive, you know. And this is, this is something that is, is quite abused in a wrong worship system. When the giving is given to a person that Yahweh has appointed to serve, it's being given to Yahweh, and that's the heart behind the giving. And that's where Shaul says, you've got to do it with a rejoicing heart. And this is what you are to bring. And so we begin here with the clear instructions of a list of things that Israel were to, were to bring. Now you've got to think, here was this nation that were a bunch of slaves, bricklayers, had to fetch their own straw. But when they plundered Mitzrayim, Yahweh equipped them with everything that they needed for these instructions to be met. So it was a test of hearts. Because now Yahweh equips you with something. The test comes, what are you doing with it? You know? And so Yahweh makes it clear that he desires spontaneous, generous giving from the heart. He also makes it clear that how we are to be generous. And he instructs us on how to give him what he wants, what he calls for. And the materials that he wanted for his tabernacle didn't just miraculously appear. The people had them to bring. So Yahweh will never ask you something that you're unable to bring. And he will never test you beyond that which you are able to bear because he knows your heart. And he will certainly test you and prove you and try you to see if his Torah is on your heart or not. Knowing this then, that the tabernacle was to be built according to the very pattern that Moshe was shown on the mountain, we realize that great care had to be taken to follow this pattern exactly. And this is so true for us today, as I said, that we take care that we follow this pattern every week where Moshe is read. We are, we are just being reminded of the pattern that we are to be following so that we are built up correctly as living stones in the master and not be found to be stones that might be removed because of leprosy in the house. You know, in other words, we've been given his Torah. His Torah is the pattern. It is the instruction. It is the design on how we are to be built up together. And when we build one another up and encourage one another in the belief, it's through the clear pattern of the Torah and set apart living that we're able to do that. You know, and so each part must do its work and must go according to the pattern, bring according to the pattern and not however they wish and see fit in their own eyes. Because when everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes, it didn't end well with them. So when we begin to look at this tabernacle, we see the shadow pictures of our every single part that was built carries so much significance. Every uh, uh, material that was, every bit of material that was brought to be made into something in the tabernacle for service, for Yahweh's presence to remain with his people, carries wonderful insight and shadow pictures of our master, Yeshua Messiah who is with us when we are gathered together in his name and by his spirit that he's put upon us, we're able to learn the valuable lessons of all these things. And when people discard the hearing of the Torah and its design and its function and the requirements and the heart that needs to be in it, they will never fully understand the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. And therefore they will run in vain. And so the first, as we look through these, we'll, we'll just go through these materials and see wonderful um, lessons on what each material represents for us. The first one is gold. Gold represents the richness, the purity the, um, of, of our master, represents his supreme position and that he is Elohim most high. You know, pure gold speaks of his mighty like power that cannot be reproduced by man. Now, the Hebrew word for gold is zahav. And it means gold or golden. In, in, in scripture, we also see that it's once translated as fair weather. And it's figuratively used 
in that means, speaking of brilliance and splendor, coming from an unused root, which means to shimmer or shine, because we know that gold shines, you know, you get that picture. So it speaks of this royalty of Messiah, and therefore highlighting him as the light of the world, you know. And we also know that the first of the three gifts that the Magi brought, not three Magi, because, they're, you know, three gifts, and what they brought when they came to the house and saw the child, who, when Messiah was about two years old in the form of man, in this flesh, they saw the king of kings. And they brought that which was prepared for, for many years beforehand, to be brought at the right time to the master. Silver is symbolic of redemption. Silver carries a weight of wealth in lessons that we can learn from Scripture. And it highlights for us the value of silver in Scripture as meaning in many ways redemption money. It represents and speaks of the price that our master paid for us. Silver was used in the service of the tent of, a, of meeting for the atonement of Israel as a remembrance before Yahweh that each one would bring their silver. The Hebrew word for silver, kesef, comes from a, the, the root word kasaf, which means to long for or to be eager for. And it's in Shemot 30 that we're going to go through next week and the, the next couple of weeks where, where the command to take up the silver for the atonement for the children of Israel. And it was given for the service of the tabernacle. So then we understand, when we understand the design as we go through this beginning today, that the tabernacle stood on sockets of silver. Yosef and Yehoshua were both sold for silver, Yosef being a wonderful shadow picture of the, what our master came to do in the flesh, redeeming his brothers. Yehuda was paid off in silver, as the scriptures said. Silver is symbolic of the redemption work of our master through Messiah and him alone. And therefore, silver represents the service of giving of oneself, which highlights the perfect work of Messiah in us. We also see a wonderful picture again of how silver is likened to the pure word of Elohim that's been tried. In Tehillah 12 verse 6, it says the words of Yahweh are clean words. Silver tried in the furnace of earth, refined seven times. And Tehillah 66 verse 10 says, for you, O Elohim, have proved us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Now, the way to refine silver and gold is to put it in the fire so that the dross comes to the surface and can be taken away and again put in the fire. So all the impurities can come to the surface and can be removed so it's presented as pure, you know. And so when we think of being tried and refined, there's valuable lessons that we are able to learn through what the Word does for us so that when we as a bride that's made herself ready for our husband's soon return, we can be presented as that pure, perfect, spotless bride. Now, the Hebrew word for tried, where the, the silver is tried in a fur furnace of earth, is tzaraf. It means to smelt, refine, try, or test. And this word is used in Shemuel Bet, chapter 22, verse 31, where it says the El, his way is perfect. The word of Yahweh is proven. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. This is such a wonderful thing for us to remember in this song that David was declaring much praise for Yahweh. The thing that we can be sure of, is that the word of Yahweh is sure, it's proven, it's trustworthy. We are able to fully trust his word. It's the only word that can be trusted. How many times have you found that the words of your friends, families, colleagues, even strangers, have failed to meet up with what they spoke? The word of Yahweh never fails. How is it that you see today many people speaking words of promise, but they fail because they can't? Fulfill that which they've promised, where everything in Messiah is yes and amen. The word of Yahweh is the sure thing that we can bank on. Amen? And it's because of this fact that we are able to find complete refuge in him. That's why he can be a shield to those who take refuge in him. When we trust in his word, we can bank on it. You know? The Hebrew word for refined is zakak. Zakak means to refine, to purify, or distill. And in Malachi or Malachi 3 verse 3, we see, and he shall sit as a refiner and a cleanser 
of silver, and he shall cleanse the sons of Levi and refine them as gold and silver, and they shall belong to Yahweh, bringing near an offering in righteousness. So here we see again the pattern. When Yahweh refines us through his word, we are bringing to him an acceptable offering in righteousness, which means according to his commands, according to the pattern. Yahweh is the one who refines us. He's the one who purifies us and causes us to be pure and set apart so that we're able to offer up to him the slaughter offerings of praise that are without blemish. You know. Now, one thing to take note of is that the purest silver doesn't tarnish. Most of the silver that we buy today is not pure silver. And that's why you see it, you know, after a while, you have to keep polishing it, you have to keep shining it. Most silver that's used today is mixed with an alloy where it might have about 90 odd percent of silver, but it has another metal to make up the rest to make it a little bit harder and easier to work with. But with that comes a bit of a process of having to keep, you know, polishing it up, keep shining it, etc. And when we understand the concept of the pure silver, we understand that our master hasn't come to bring us 90% of a cleansing so that we add in what we think should be there with our own ideas, because then all you're going to have to do is keep shining, keep shining, keep rubbing away the blemishes that keep surfacing. But when we walk in the fullness of our master's truth, we can be sure that we don't have to keep trying to polish ourselves up, so to speak, to put on a show. We can allow his word to be the perfect reflection of a redemption being worked out with fear and trembling before his face. So when his word is likened to silver that's tried in the furnace of the earth and refined seven times, we understand this is a wonderful picture again of our observance of his appointed times because it represents the fullness thereof of the complete work of redemption that we have seen our master buy for us through his own life, death and resurrection, but is an assurance to us who stay in him and allow his word to refine us to be completed when he comes again. And so we understand that without the word, we cannot be refined. And then we've got bronze. So we've got gold that represents the royalty, the supreme position of our master. The silver representing that supreme position of our master coming to buy a people back to himself that had been sold into slavery because of sin. Then we've got bronze. This speaks of the working of that redemption. The bronze speaks of judgment and punishment of sin. Bronze in Hebrew is the word nechosheth, and it's used in places where extreme strength and heat resistance was extremely important and required. Bronze has a melting point of 1,985 degrees. It's important to understand that's pretty hot. Okay, <laughs> you know, and so the slaughter place needed to be made of bronze where it can manage the intensity of the heat of the fire that would burn up the offerings put on it. They brought bronze and not brass. So there's a difference between bra brass comes from a mixture of copper and zinc where bronze comes from copper and usually tin is an additive. But bronze in scripture represents judgment. When Moshe raised the bronze serpent in the wilderness, which we read of in Bimit by 21 verse 9, we also understand it was a picture and shadow picture of Messiah being lifted up on our behalf. And all who look to him will be healed. You know? And so bronze typifies the very character of Yeshua Messiah who took upon himself the fire of Elohim's wrath and justice by becoming a sin offering and making atonement for our lives. Now, the tent pegs of the tabernacle were made of bronze, and it's also symbolic of the complete work of our master and highlights the suffering that our master would face on our behalf. And so the, when we understand the idea of tent pegs, Sukkot's drawing near, and we're still trying to find a camp this year, so keep praying. But get your tent pegs ready. Okay, now when you understand a tent peg and you see the design of the tabernacle with the tent pegs bronze, the bronze, the pegs would basically go into the ground and obviously hold the ropes tight. So you've got a bit out and a bit in the ground. Therefore, it shows us that 
our master defeated death. In the design of the tabernacle, we see how through his sacrifice, he has overcome death and he secured for us a dwelling in him forever. You know, bronze was used to make the mirrors in ancient times. Now, it was used as opposed to glass and it would be made of fine beaten, beaten work. Now, you had to know how fine that work had to be because you didn't want to look into a mirror that, you know, makes you look all lumpy, you know, <laughs> so to speak. I don't know another word to it, but it's so fine that this, these bronze mirrors were beaten so that you could see what you look like. And the mirrors that the woman who worshipped at the tent door, they were taken to make the bronze laver. And that laver was used to take water from for the priest to wash their hands and feet before doing service in the set-apart place. Therefore, we understand that this is a wonderful picture of looking into the mirror of the word and not forgetting what we are to look like through the redemptive work that our master brought for us, you know, and his, he allows that word to, or we allow his word to shape us and form us, having his image and likeness being fully restored that was once corrupted through sin of the first Adam. But now in the last Adam, it has been made available for a restoration to take place. For he has taken the judgment upon himself for all who look to him and allow that cleansing to take place. The blue material, in Hebrew, the word for blue is techelet. And we know from looking through the design, some that haven't heard this before might not know, but blue in Scripture is a wonderful representation of the Torah or the instructions, the commands, the ordinances, the precepts, the very foundation of the righteousness and judgment and justice of the throne of Yahweh, what his throne is established upon. Now, a throne represents authority. It represents the rulership over that which submits to that rulership. And therefore, the foundation of that rulership has its standards, has its precepts, its instructions. And that's what the blue represents, especially as we consider the, the, the pavement of sapphire that was a representation of, of the foundation of the throne of our master, you know. Blue loops were to be made at the edges of the curtains. We're going to look at the curtains just now for the dwelling place. We also understand that the blue reminds us of the heavens above where Yahweh dwells and from where his word comes. Blue on the frid fringes of the, uh, of the curtains of the dwelling place teaches us again why we're instructed in Bamidbar 15 to put Blue in the tzitzit that we are to make for the four corners of our garments. You know, we are to make tassels, tzitzits, wings, if you will, you know, and in those tassels we are to have a blue thread so as to remind us not to rebel against the commands, but we remember to do his commands. So when we understand this, we also see why it's important for us to, as children of Israel, not just males, but all children of Israel, to wear tzitzit. Now, there's, there's variant, variant forms of making a tassel. can be small, can be big, can be done according to the traditional ways of five knots and wrapping the blue around at certain numerical values of the, of the name of Yahweh, the Yod Heh Vav Heh. We understand that that's wonderful to do, but it's, it's not a prescribed thing. This prescribed thing is make a tassel, and in that tassel, make sure there is a blue thread. So the tassel can have other colors, but it must have blue. Now we understand that when we see also the, the power of this reminding us for the commands, then we see the, the, the incident that happened that the woman that was bleeding for 12 years as a representation of the 12 tribes in urgent need of a healer, bleeding, their life going out from them, when she touched the hem of the master's robe, she was immediately healed. Again, it's a clinging to the commands of our master that heals us, that gives us our strength to not be losing life, but to be walking in the life that he's given us. And when we walk in obedience to his commands, he makes his dwelling with us. And we walk in the blessings that are given to us in the Torah and the prophets, you know. And so if we don't do what his Torah says, how will we remember what's to be on our hearts? And if we don't wear how will we remember to remember the commands? 
that we are to do and are to be upon our hearts. We have a responsibility, you know, and yes, part of that responsibility is wearing tzitzit. It forms part of that. We must study the Torah and know what the tzitzits are reminding us of. So just wearing tzitzit because somebody told you to wear it, but you're not actually meditating on the word getting in there day and night. Then it's just like those that love to make their tzitzits long that the master said the Pharisees were like, you know. The purple material highlights royalty. So the gold also represents the supreme position of our master, but purple also reflects a, a picture of royalty. Kings were typically robed in purple in ancient times, still today in many ways. It identifies Messiah as the true king of kings. As we understand purple, the color purple is a mixture of blue and scarlet. And we realize that the blue representing the heavens and coming down, shedding his blood as a picture of scarlet, where he shed his blood here on earth, now exalted on high, seated above all, highlighting that he is the supreme authority, the king of kings. The enemy's attempt at counterfeiting this kingship is very obvious in its service here on earth, where we see a corrupt system. We think of Rome and their garments of many of their um, leaders dressed in purple. You know, it's interesting. Purple and black seem to be the predominant colors in a corrupt worship system. Now, we know purple is that which represents our master. Even when they mocked our master, they put a purple robe on him, put a crown of thorns on his head, and they mocked him. Then they took it off him again. We know purple has a valuable lesson in the fullness of the design of our master as being part of that. And we also understand that there's an enemy who's trying to counterfeit that authority. Because in the enemy's presentation of authority, you will find no blue. You know, even in so in one aspect, you've got the Catholic system that you won't find any blue in their bishops or popes or whatever they want to call them, cardinals. You'll find purple in black. With Yahweh's design, you find his priesthood is in white. And here we see part of the purple that was used in the tent, covering the tent um, door, the high priest garments. We see valuable lesson, the wrappers that were used in some parts of the tabernacle. We see that it's always a reflection of which authority are we submitting to, you know. And so we understand even in uh, when I looked at blue and then we understand that purple represents royalty, we also see that in rabbinic Judaism, when they make tzitzits, they don't put blue in it because they claim their own authority over the word to interpret it as they see fit here on earth, which again is a corruption of the presentation of the fullness of the authority of the word of Elohim that comes from above and doing according to the pattern which is in the heavens, letting it being done here on earth. Then we've got scarlet material. Scarlet material comes from two words, Tola'ath, which is worm, and Shani, which is crimson or scarlet. And what we take note of here is a wonderful picture that scarlet speaks of the sacrifice of Messiah, his sufferings, his giving of himself, coming here to earth and taking the form of man. Even when Yaakov is Yaakov, you worm, you know, it's kind of thing where he laid down his deity. He took the form of man and shed his blood here on earth in order for us to have that cleansing which we need. And it highlights blood atonement and sacrifice. We are to be on guard against the fa false messages that are being presented out there that are counterfeiting this representation of authority. The scarlet refers to atonement and sacrifice that our master brings fulfilled at the completion of Yom Kippur. We note how the harlot whore of Babylon rides on a scarlet beast and is dressed in purple and scarlet, causing many to be, sorry, she's riding on a scarlet beast, she's yes, dressed in purple and scarlet, and she is causing many to become drunk on the maddening adulteries by giving them her cup. And therefore, we either partake of the cup of the master or the cup of demons. We can't partake in both. We are to guard against the corruption of the truth and the presentation of that which discards the clear pattern of our master. The, then we see the fine linen that was to be brought. Hebrew word for fine linen is shesh. 
And fine linen, as we know in Scripture, represents the righteousnesses of the set-apart ones, which we see in Chazon 19, and being declared it was given for the bride to be dressed in fine linen. It is the righteousnesses of the set-apart ones, and that Greek word for fine linen is busos. And from this word we get the adjective businos in Greek, and that's what's referred to as the fine linen in Chazon. We are given the promise for those who overcome will be dressed in white robes and will not be blotten, blotten, blotted out of the book of life. So fine linen speaks of purity. It speaks of righteousness and a sinless life of Messiah as we are clothed in him because he's clothed us from on high. We know what righteousness is for us. It's to guard the commands of Yahweh. So the righteous garments that we've been given is obedience to his commands. And so the Hebrew word, or sorry, the Greek word that's used for dressed in Chazon, when the command is, or the, the instruction has been given to be dressed in fine linen, is peribalo, which means to put on, to clothe, to wrap around. You get the idea. I mean, you put on, you clothe yourself with something. And this is what we are called to be dressed in. And why I'm mentioning this is because this Greek word, so I'm going from Hebrew to Greek back to Hebrew for a good reason. So when we look at this Greek word now used in the renewed writings of being dressed, we see this Greek word being used in the Septuagint of Mishle 31 verse 22 in describing the characteristics of a capable woman, which is a parable for the bride. You know, in verse 22, it says she shall make tapestry for herself. She is dressed in fine linen. Now, that Hebrew word that's used there for dressed is levush. It's not French, it's Hebrew. And it means garment, clothing, apparel, coming from the verb lavash, which means to put on, to wear, or to be clothed. Okay? Now, why I'm mentioning this is to highlight that lavash in Scripture is used in a number of ways. Firstly, it's used to represent being clothed, which makes sense because you put on. It's also used as being clothed as a sign of rank or a status or character. And it's also used in poetic figures, likening abstract qualities to clothing. So we always get this idea of lavush being used as something that speaks of that which we are to put on as a marker of identity. So when we put on Messiah, it's the proper representation of putting on righteousness. And we are taking that which the shepherd has brought for the house to be secured by the word. And again, levush or lavash, levush actually, in, in to, um, which is the clothing. And when you look at that in the pictographic script, we get this idea of a shepherd's rod, a house, tent floor plan with the bait, a vav giving us the security and the shin with the word. We understand that the, the shepherd's house is secured in the word. So therefore, without Messiah, we have no clothing. We are naked and ashamed. But with him, we have a covering that is secure. Just as our master made a covering and put coats of skin, which is also described in that which was brought for the tabernacle on Adam and Chava. Then the goat's hair that was to be brought, pictures for us, when we think of goats, we think of Yom Kippur, where the two goats were brought before Yahweh and lots would be cast. One for Aharon and one for Azazel, or one for Yahweh and one for Azazel, you know. One would be prepared as a sin offering, and the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell is caused to stand before Yahweh to make atonement on it and send it into the wilderness to Azazel. And it's a picture again when our master comes, he will bind Satan for a thousand years and highlights again the fullness of the work of atonement that he's done for us in one aspect of cleansing us from sin as the goat that's put on the slaughter place as a, and also removing sin from us as far as the east is from the west with Azazel being taken out into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. We also understand that the picture of goat teaches us a valuable lesson in Scripture because the goat is, you know, highlights for us uh, there's a number of things that we can see. The, the, the Hebrew word that's translated as goat comes from the root word ez, which can mean a young goat. And we also see it can also give reference to when 
Yosef was sold and they took his robe and dipped it in the blood. When they killed a male goat, they dipped the robe in the blood and a shadow picture of our master taking sin upon himself and becoming that atonement for our sins. And so we see a powerful picture of the goat hair that was to be brought. Then the ram skins dyed red. The ram skins picture for us a substitutionary sacrifice. Rams in the Hebraic mindset from a scriptural point of view always carries with it as a forefront idea of substitutionary sacrifice. Why? Because we are reminded of the instruction that Avraham was given to go and offer up Yitzchak. This was a test for Avraham. And when they were on their way, I remind you that Yitzchak was already in his 30s, you know, carrying the wood and asking his father, where is the lamb? And Ab uh, Avraham said, on this hill Yahweh will provide. And when he was about to kill his son, the messenger of Yahweh said, stop, now I know that you obey me. And he looked and he saw a ram in a thorn bush. And the ram was offered up in the place of Yitzchak. And Hebrews teaches us a valuable lesson that by belief, Abraham received Yitzchak back from the dead as a picture of that which our master also has given us. But this was a test of obedience. And so when we think of the ram skins die red, we think of how our master has purchased us from the grave. You know? And so therefore, when we understand this, we see that ramskins also represent strength. It's the same word that's used for terebinth or mighty for a ram. It's ayil. So it can mean terebinth, doorpost, but it also means ram. So it highlights stability. Now, we also understand a ram represents maturity. I sent out a message this week from Yirmiyahu, be as rams before the flock, teaching us a valuable lesson about taking responsibility, not waiting for somebody else to do it before you decide if you want to do it. It's taking that as an authoritative position in the word before the flock so that others will follow your example. That takes maturity. Okay? And so it teaches us valuable lessons in the design of the tabernacle that this service promotes a learning to maturity to lack nothing. Then we've got the fine le leather. Fine leather is tachash. And the skin of the leather would be used for the outer covering of the dwelling place that everyone saw. Now, typically, out of all the garments and all the materials that were brought, the fine leather, although we hear the word fine, it was probably not the finest of things that would, one would look at. Because typically, unless leather's dyed or patterned or whatever, it, it's nothing great to look at. It's, it's just like it's tough skin. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so this teaches us a valuable lesson as the outer laying of the dwelling place, you know, because they're very plain in their appearance. And this speaks a great deal of Messiah coming in the flesh. Why? It speaks to what Yeshua was to man here on earth when he came. There was no outward beauty that the tabernacle being covered by this leather, the fine leather, and so it was when Messiah came. We read in Scripture in Yeshayahu 53, verse 1 to 2, Who has believed our report, and to whom has, was the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. In other words, he came as a man. He took on the former man, yet knew no sin. And clearly, in the eyes of Yahweh, man and not an appearance that was attractive because of sin. And so it wasn't something, he didn't come here shining like, oh, this is it, you know, and everybody, they didn't recognize him. They said, who is this? So it wasn't something like, wow, but it was for good reason, because it carries great weight for us, you know. Yeshua to the Yehudim, the Yehudim, was nothing more than just a bit of leather. Nothing good to look at, you know. And it was nothing but a rough and tough piece of skin in their eyes because it wasn't the way they expected the Messiah to look. But to us who have opened up to him and to whom he's opened our eyes and our hearts and our ears, 
to have his word upon our hearts, to hear him, to know him, to have the revelation made perfectly clear, we understand that he's far more than a leather to us. We need that leather as protection because the outer covering of leather certainly protected all the other layers for the intimacy in the dwelling place because it protected it from the elements. And so too do we need to understand the validity of the picture of the fine leather that we, represents a complete covering that we have in the master. But you see, while others are outside and don't represent the beauty of what's within this word, we who draw near to the master on his appointed times have that covering protection, knowing even as we're looking at the rain and the wind and everything these days, we have that security, but we have that intimacy and we see the beauty that's under the veil, if you will, of the beauty of Scripture that many cannot see from the outside. So you must fit the skin. So yes. Just the man. Yes. But the Udin says Yeshua was just a man walking. With God. Yes. But we see past that, like we said last week, when you eat in his presence, you see him on the throne. You yes. You see the inside of yeah. the outer layer of skin. Yes. That's when they had that meal with him on the mountain. It was just a wonderful picture to tie that in. And as we get that picture and we tie it in with the design of the tabernacle that we're running through over the next couple of weeks, everything, the puzzle pieces start to come together. Then we've got acacia wood. Now, acacia wood in, in Hebrew, it's the shita, and it grew in the deserts of Sinai and the deserts of, around the Dead Sea. It's a very hard wood. It's indestructible by insects. In other words, it won't get your, what do you call those things? Beetles, Beetles yes. You know, so when you do a beetle inspection on the tabernacle, it will pass, okay? And so it has fine, beautiful grain, and it was remarkably luxuriant in dry places, sometimes attaining a height of 20 feet. So it's, it's a reasonably, not a huge, not meters, but it's still a big, biggish tree. And what the shita wood teaches us, it teaches us the indestructibility of Messiah and his incorruptibility in the flesh. Shita also means sticks or pierces. Why? Because this tree was very, had a lot of branches and very thorny branches. And it would almost, the way the branches would go, it was like a hodgepodge, if that's a good word to describe it, of twigs. And so very few of the branches were actually thick enough to make boards out of. So you had to join the branches together to make a board, and that's what was used in the tabernacle. So it's a picture, again, that it's the sticks coming together to be made one in him. And so we understand when we think of the two sticks of Ephraim and Yehuda being brought together, again, we see this powerful picture in the design of the tabernacle of bringing us together as branches of the vine, as sticks, you know, being brought together and being made one in him. This wood wouldn't rot at all, and it speaks of the endurance and the purity of our master. And as we're grafted into him and stay in him, we will never see a decay or rot that sin once was causing in our lives. Amen? Now, it's also understood when we think of acacia, acacia wood was used right through the tabernacle. It was used to construct the bronze slaughter place, obviously then covered with the bronze that would, you know, retain the heat. It was used for the bronze laver, the showbread table, the slaughter place of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant, as well as the boards of the dwelling place. So it's a clear picture of a reflection also of the cedar wood that was used. Cedar and acacia, a similar wood that was used because it's similar in nature of the hardness, the indestructibility. And so all of this was done according to the pattern that Moshe, or firstly, we're looking at this week's instruction of that which was to be brought because Moshe was shown a pattern on the mountain. Moshe was shown what was about to be built on the mountain. He got to see in the heavens and we looked last week when the elders had a meal, they also got a picture into the heavens of the throne of the master. And in many ways, they got to see a reflection of what they were about to build and, or bring a contribution for that would be built between the set-apart place and the most set-apart place. That where we have fellowship with him and his throne of authority, you know. So this wood speaks of unity. It pictures for us 
um, everything being placed in order. All of the various pieces of the tabernacle that were to be brought on their own. They're just, oh, that's nice, that's nice, but ineffective. But when brought together and performed perfectly according to the functional design of Yahweh, it represents perfection and set apartness that he calls for. This teaches us that we need to be in unity in order to be formed and shaped into being a functional tabernacle of Elohim, which we are. That's why when two walk together, if they can't agree, they can't walk together because there's no unity. You're going to be against, you're going to be breaking down and not building up. So therefore, we understand that as our master adds and takes away, he's the one that's building. And therefore, we understand according to his design, and his design is set apartness. And we go through phases where set apartness is breached. Yahweh removes. He adds again. He cuts off. He adds. And so he's the one building this perfect house. And as long as we stay in him, we can be sure that we will not be removed. And that's where we're given that promise in Yochanan 15. If we stay in him, he will stay in us. And if we then are staying in him, we bear fruit that lasts. But if we don't bear fruit, we'll be taken out. So all of these things, when we think of all these parables and the wordings of our master, it's all coming back to asking the question, do you know the design of the tabernacle? Are you actually being built up according to that design? As it is in heaven, is it being done here on earth? You know, and so then they were to, instructed to bring oil um, and pressed olive oil that would be obtained through the crushing of olive berries. Now, when Yeshua went to Gethsemane, he sweat blood. And in many ways, he was pressed down and crushed because of our iniquities, our sins. The Hebrew word Gethsemane comes from, because it's a contracted word in the Greek from the Hebrew, and it comes from Gath, which is a place of pressing oil or wine, and Shemen, which is oils. Now, in the days of Messiah, there was such a thing called a Gethsemane, which was a huge stone weight that was placed on a basket of olive pulp. Because what you first have, when you gather the olives, you gather it in a Hessian basket, then you put it on an olive crusher. Now, an olive crusher would have an upper and a lower millstone. And it, then you would crush the olives, so now it become a pulp. Then you take that pulp, still in the Hessian bag in the pulp, and you put it on a Gethsemane on a surface, and then a huge stone weight is just put on the Gethsemane, and it just presses. And the longer it presses, so then the oil is able to come out. You know, And so when, when we see this enormous pressure on the olive pulp producing the oil that was squeezed out in a trough and collected, we understand this imagery, imagery of Gethsemane that our master went to when he went into the olive grove on Gethsemane and he was praying and he sweat blood. That's that picture and idea that we get of the crushing of our iniquities that already began the process before we'd be put to death on the stake. He was already being crushed, presenting for us the ability for a bride that would be brought forth by his life, death and resurrection would have the spirit, the oil to light their lamps. Amen. It's in Luke 22 where you can read of him being in agony and sweating um, like great drops of blood falling to the ground. It's not, you know, I know it says his sweat became like great drops of blood. So a lot of people say he sweat blood. There is a, a physiological a, a explanation that one can give, but it's just giving the identity of understanding that we have a master who has provided for us because without oil of crushed olives, there would be no service for the tabernacle because along with the blood of bulls and goats and the oil, everything would be anointed. And then the oil would be used for the lamps to put light on the showbread table so that they could come in and have the proper service. So without the oil, there could be no service. You see, when you are keeping the Torah by the letter only, but not by the spirit of Elohim, then it becomes a list of do's and don'ts, which it is, but it's done with the spirit as a pledge on our hearts, showing that 
as he willingly gave his life for us, we have willingly said yes. And when we've said yes, we relinquish all self-choice. We now are serving and set apartness and are always required to have oil in our lamps. Therefore, all the children of Israel bringing oil for the light, crushed olives, we understand that it's a responsibility of everybody to be shining the light of the master. That's why he said you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. And it was always in the idea of persecution. So under the persecution and trials of this life, we get to shine and serve completely in set apartness. Amen? So priests, prophets, kings were anointed with oil. And it highlights here that there is the, oil, the anointing oil that was called to be brought forth here was restricted for tabernacle use only. And any violation in regard to this would result in death. Now, the, it had to be pure. And it represents the purity of Messiah who was anointed the anointed one who offered himself for us. Even when he opened up the scroll, he confirmed this when he read from Yeshiyahu that the spirit of the master Yahweh is upon him, anointed to bring the good news, you know, to open up the eyes of the blind, to release the captives. And then he closed the scroll before it declared that the vengeance of Elohim, because he came to proclaim a deliverance. He's coming with vengeance, but that wasn't his first coming's purpose. Then the spices for the anointing oil, I'm not going to go into all that because that will touch next week. When we look at the spices for the anointing oil and the incense, which we're going to read in Shemot 30. So I'm not going to touch on those. They are in the notes if you want to go through them, but it, we'll, we'll look at those next week. And these spices that were for the anointing oil and the sweet incense carry valuable lesson for us again in teaching us that we are to be the fragrance of Messiah wherever we are. To some, that may be the fragrance of life to life and others death to death. But the Hebrew word for anointing, for the anointing oil, is moshcha. It means anointing, anointed, consecrated portion, anointing oil or ointment coming from the verb mashach, which means to smear or anoint or spread a liquid or to be anointed. Now, the first time that we see moshcha being used is in this uh, Torah portion that we've just read. And it forms part of these instructions that were required for the contributions that were to be taken up. Among the various items that were required, we see that this verse highlights it was used also for spices for the anointing oil. And so incense in Hebrew is ketoreth. It, it's, it means the smoke or odor of burning. So in other words, when something's burning, you get a smell. Okay, so that's the incense. Now it highlights the idea of the sweet smoke of sacrifice and what is to Yahweh very pleasing to his nostrils is obedience now we can take it on a practical level how many of you love when you know, well I don't know many people there might be a few but that smell of a, a lamb on a braai <laughs> you know now and I don't know I'm, I'm not trying to lighten the work of our master and what the sacrifices represent but we can we can imagine what that Fragrance must have been in the wilderness going up before Yahweh when the offerings were brought as they should have been, you know. And so when we think of this word ketoreth used to describe incense that was also burned on the slaughter place of incense every morning when Aharon would go in to trim the lamps to give light on menorah, we also understand this intercession, prayers that we are to be praying for one another, you know. Shemot 30 verse 1 says you make a slaughter a place to burn incense on, make it of acacia wood. So we're going to look at that next week. Um, what we understand when we look at this, this was a clear instruction to burn incense on this according to the exact design that Yahweh gave, which we'll again look at next week. But what we do understand from this incense is that we are to be the fragrance of Messiah, and we can only be that when we are following the pattern. When you're adding other mixtures to your worship, when you're mixing worship in whatever form, you taint that incense picture pattern that reflects something that's not acceptable in offering of prayer before the master. That's why we see in the Psalms that he who turns his ear away from hearing of the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. 
So he understands that when one is not doing the pattern of obedience, your prayers are not acceptable. They're not the incense formula pattern that's described for us to be done before the master. And then we've got the Shoham stones. The Shoham is a precious stone. It's often translated as onyx. And they were on the shoulder garment of the breastplate of the high priest. On each Shoham stone were written six names of the tribes on one stone, the other six on, of the tribes on the other stone. And in the breastplate, the Shoham stone represented, according to birthright, the stones, the Shoham stone represents Yosef in the ephod. And so they represent Yosef, and Yosef is a clear shadow picture of Messiah as he kept all the sons of Yaakov alive during famine. And it's again a, prof a prophetic understanding of who our master is, where he would come, the son that was born unto us, and upon him the rule would be, the rule would be on his shoulder. So the picture of the high priest having the Shoham stones on, his, on the shoulder garment represents the authority by which the high priest intercedes on behalf of the people. Besides the Shoham stones, there were also stones that were to be brought to be set in the shoulder garment and the breastplate of the high priest. And the Hebrew word for stones is avne. Avne comes from the word even, which means a stone, a cornerstone, or differing weights. It even is translated as plumb line. Now, in the breastplate where the 12 stones for the tribes of Israel were put, each stone represented each tribe. And so from the stones that were brought, we're able to recognize the clear picture how we, as living stones, are being built up in the master. Now, the, the word for stone, Evan, comes from the verb bana. Bana means to build, to besiege, construct, establish a family, or be built up. And another word that's derived from bana is the Hebrew word ben which is son or grandson or member of a group or children, plural also banim for family, male and female. So sonship in scripture is not restricted to males alone. Sonship in scripture carries the idea because whenever in Hebrew you address a crowd of people, you address them in the masculine. So we see a wonderful witness here again us as living stones being built up in the master, you know. Tehillah 103 verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, banim, plural for stones, plural for sons, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. So a wonderful picture again that we understand what this means. Sonship, I must remind you in Scripture, and that's what Shaul highlights in his letter to the believers in Rome. It's not always regarded to being a natural position based on physical bloodline, but rather sonship is that which is conferred to us by an act of Elohim because we are grafted in and we become children of Israel. So sonship should not be understood as an assured sonship based on natural descent or merit, but rather it's an extension of the favor, the mercy, the compassion of Elohim, based on his loving commitment to the covenants of promise that he made with Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And therefore, when we understand that we are to be built up in the master as living stones, we need to make sure that we are truly representative of the house of Elohim, as sons that represent what the rules of his house are, as we are ambassadors of his coming kingdom here on earth. And wherever we put our feet, his rules apply. Amen. The shoulder garment um, in Hebrew is ephod. It means outer garment of the priest. And it was worn by the priests. Or the, the, the outer garment that was worn by the priest was white. But the high priest would wear an off, uh, uh, ephod. And in this ephod would be the, the breastplate that would have all the stones, etc., etc., and Hebrew word for breastplate, choshen, means a breastplate, a breast piece or a pouch, breast piece or a pouch. And it was made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine woven linen. So you begin to see all these materials starting to come together. It held the stones 
And we also understand that the, it, it was used as or referred to as the breastplate of righteousness or right ruling. Now, we looked last week at the right ruling being a foundation of the throne of Yahweh. Justice and right ruling are the foundation of his throne. And so we understand again that as high priest, he performed the function according to the perfect right rulings. He came to fully meet all the requirements and make known the full requirements of a priesthood and a set-apart nation and a treasured possession that have now been purchased by him and have said, I do, can now obey perfectly and have their feet firmly planted on a foundation of righteousness. Amen. Make me a dwelling place. And I will dwell in your midst, Yahweh said in verse 8. The tabernacle requires your best, and it requires that your heart is in it. That's really what we get from this instructions that are being given here. This first chapter on the, on, I was going to say the ingredients, on the, <laughs> well, they are ingredients, okay? There's a good recipe that we're getting here, because this is a recipe for success. Okay, because when you meditate on this, you will be successful and prosperous in all that you do. And so when we understand the Hebrew word for uh, set apart place, we learn some wonderful lessons. Set apart place is mikdash. It means a set apart place, a sanctuary. And it comes from the verb kadash, which we know very well means set apart, consecrated, coming from the verb kodesh, which means to be set apart or that which is dedicated and separated unto Yahweh. And so we are separated ones unto the Master. And what's clear for us is that we have a set-apart standard to live by. And when we think of this set-apart place being called Mikdash, we understand that this is what we are. We're a dwelling place of the Master that is not like the dwelling place of the enemy. What has the dwelling place of Elohim to do with idols? The obvious answer is nothing. Therefore, we should have nothing to do with idol worship in whatever form that may present itself. We have a form, we have a pattern in which we are to present ourselves, and that's what we are busy looking at. And as we diligently obey the Sabbaths, the feasts of our Master, and His commands that go for everyday living, we begin to see how we are established as a reflection of the pattern of the dwelling of our Master that's in the heavens, you know? And so when we come to, when we understand this whole tabernacle, we picture the scene. In the back of the Scriptures, you get a layout of it. You can kind of get the idea, but in your mind's eye, look at the notes. I've given a couple of pictures that depict what the idea is when you've got, we look at this here, that you've got the, the dwelling place and within the dwelling place is the most set-apart place and the set-apart place. And then outside that, you've got the bronze laver that used for washing hands and feet of the priest. And then you've got the bronze slaughter place upon which the offerings were, were done. And then you've got the gate. That's where people would bring their offerings to the gate, the door. And around the entire dwelling place, you have a courtyard that is surrounded by fine linen curtains upheld by poles that were securing the entire dwelling place to keep out what should not be in and keep in what should be in. <laughs> it makes sense. You know, so when we come, when we learn this pattern of this tabernacle, we understand the pattern of our drawing near to the master. We come to the door, the gate, as pictured through the door of appointment, the Sabbaths, the feasts of the master. And we can only come through the door, which is Messiah. There's no other access into our master's presence, but by that which he's provided for us. And as we enter in through our immersion in his name, we think, picture yourself walking through the, the earthly tabernacle in your mind. You come to the door, we understand Messiah is the door. It's a picture of confession. At the door, the one who's bringing their offering has to slaughter the offering. Then the priest would handle that offering on the slaughter place. So therefore, we offer up a slaughter offering of praise. When we go past that 
slaughter place, the bronze slaughter place, we're reminded that we are to be a daily living offering. Daily living offering because he died for us and rose again that we may have life and life abundantly. But in order to do that correctly and come to the appointed times by the set-apart place where the showbread table is, where the menorah gives light for it, we have to pass the bronze laver, which reminds us to look intently into the mirror of the word and understand, are we being a living sacrifice? Am I coming into the presence of the master as I should? Have I prepared myself properly with hands and feet cleansed according to the word or do I still have the dirt of this world and bringing that into the master's presence and rendering my worship as ineffective and when we come into the set apart place the what our master has done as opposed to the service of the tabernacle which was a shadow picture of the coming good matters the veil has been taken away that we get to see him. As we looked at a glimpse in history last week when the 70 elders and Moshe and Aharon and his sons and, and Yos, um, Yehoshua ate with Yahweh on the mountain and saw his throne. So we see the, the wonderful picture of what was there. There was now a pattern given, but there was a veil there for good purpose, and we're going to discuss a lot of that. But now in the master, we understand this function of the tabernacle as a practical means of understanding how we draw near to our master in perfection. You know, the set apart place teaches us valuable lessons with this menorah lighting the table of the showbread. And every Shabbat, the 12 breads that were put on the showbread table were replaced. So every week we come and we go again through a fresh hearing of the Torah portion, the bread of life, that we come and as we come into the house, the light of that word, we get revelation into the word. But every night and day, or day and night, those lamps needed to be trimmed so that the light is put on. So it teaches us a valuable lesson again in the master. If we are not meditating on the Torah, on his instructions day and night, we may come to the Shabbat, and there's no revelation, there's no light, you know. Then you're trying to light a fire. Then you're trying to figure out what's going on, but you haven't been actually keeping the lamp trimmed, keeping oil in your lamp so that it can burn, so that when we come collectively together, the revelation is made more clear. Do you see the wonderful pattern that's given for us? You know, so I've given you, in a sense, a brief overview of the design. And a lot of people think that they have access to the master's presence, but they're not following the functional pattern of the service of the tabernacle. You know, and as I said, if you're not trimming your lamp, so to speak, day and night, every day, not getting your daily bread, you will come on a Shabbat and it won't mean anything to you. You might as well be asleep because your ears and eyes are already shut the rest of the week. That's, and some people are religiously keeping the Sabbath, but they're getting nothing out of it because they have no stamina in the week to live set-apart lives. So they corrupt their lives. They join themselves to wrong things. But when we are joyfully coming into the Master's presence, it's because we are continually giving our heart, giving our oil, all, with oil. <laughs> Amen? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 to 17, What union has the dwelling place of Elohim with idols? For you are a dwelling place of Elohim, as Elohim has said, I shall dwell in them and walk among them, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh, and do not touch what is unclean, and I shall receive you. You see, when you're touching too much unclean stuff, how do you expect to be received by Yah? Do according to all that I show you. This is very clear. The Hebrew word that's translated as dwelling place is mishkan, and it means a dwelling place or a tabernacle or tent coming from shachan, which means to settle down or abide, establish. We get the idea when you pitch a tent, you settle. You're not journeying, you're settling. Okay. So Moshe was instructed to build this dwelling place according to the pattern that he was shown, and this he was given where Elohim dwells in the heavenlies. This is where I come to, I've said pattern a number of times today, and I hope that it sticks in your mind always. The Hebrew word for pattern is tavnith. Tavnith means construction, pattern, figure, copy, image, likeness, model, plan. It comes from the word bana, which we've already discussed, which is to build, to construct. 
So if you want to be a living stone, you can only be one when you follow the plan. You know? So it's Yahweh who builds us up. Kepha reminds us that we draw near to him, a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious. So you also, as living stones, are being built up, chosen by Elohim. A spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yehoshua Messiah. So I'm emphasizing this word pattern because that's exactly what we go through. When our master gives us a pattern, we would do well to follow it, which he has given us. In Matit Yahu 6, when our master was teaching us how to pray as a pattern, he didn't give us a recital. He gave us a pattern. He says, our father who is in the heavens, let your name be set apart. Let your reign come. Let your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Greek for as it is is hos. It means as like or even as, and the teaching that our master was teaching us, follow the pattern. He wasn't discarding what Moshe was given because the heavenlies haven't changed. And so therefore the pattern of service hasn't changed. And so the pattern of the dwelling place has always been one that comes from above. And therefore we recognize how important it is for us to study and meditate on the Torah of Elohim to know his pattern for us, his dwelling place. So let's look now. We've took, looked at all the, we've looked at all the materials. We've spoken a bit about the pattern. Then we see that which is made, and it starts at the heart of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. Make an ark of acacia wood and overlay it with gold inside and out. This is important for us to understand. Nobody would ever get to see inside the Ark of the Covenant. But it still had to be covered with gold as it was on the outside. And this is a valuable lesson because when our master came in the flesh, he rebuked the religious Pharisees. He called them hypocrites. He said, because you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're filled with plunder. And unrighteousness, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside. That's why David says, create in me a clean heart. Because if your heart's not in it, you can polish up the outside as much as you want. And it might look awesome to some, but it's abominable to Yahweh, you know? We are to make sure that we are clean inside and out, overlaid with the purity of, of his rich and precious word. The ark, what was inside the ark, gives us great insight for us and what we are to understand as being his dwelling place of his spirit. Because we are the dwelling place of his spirit, which we are. And therefore we have no unions with false spirits. We are a, we are a vessel and we are to be a vessel unto value in the master's hands. Gold refined through fire, we've spoken about that, going through the trials of life. And when we think of this, when we look at this, I heard a saying long time ago, and, and I kind of enjoy this in a sense because it teaches us a valuable lesson, and it was that the earth is at the heart of the universe, or Yahweh's creation, if you will, because it's his focal point. Israel is at the heart of the earth. Yerushalayim is at the heart of Israel. The temple was at the heart of Yerushalayim. The ark is at the heart of the temple. And the commands that are in the ark are at the heart of Yahweh's equipping for his people. And the Sabbath is at the heart of the commands. It's a nice thing just to think about how we get. And that we say well, now when we're starting with this pattern, we start with the ark and we go out. And we then go out to the showbread table and the menorah and everything else. And, and then we, you know, so it, again, when you start with the Sabbath right, that's the heart of the matter. You learn how all the things come together and bring protection for a service that's complete. The heart of the matter is simply this. Yahweh has provided a perfect plan for us to be at rest with him as we guard his Sabbaths and commands in our hearts that we may have the assurance, assurance of him dwelling in our midst. Amen? 
Nuach was commanded to cover the ark inside and out. It would protect them. It would stop it from leaking, that's for sure. But we understand a clear witness of having his commands in our heart. We can't literally see inside our heart. But we know that when we cry out to him and cleanse our lives from the junk and follow his pattern, he creates in us a clean heart. He cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve a living Elohim so that we can have the assurance that when we follow his commands, what you see outside is the assurance of what should be inside because it's from the overflow of a heart that a man speaks. So we know people by their fruits. We'll get to know if their hearts are, are as what is on the outside by what they say, what they do. And we are to make sure that our speech is seasoned with salt and that whatever we do in word or deed, it's done in the name of Yeshua Messiah. It's done in his perfect pattern, you know. So the Hebrew word for ark is aron. It means a chest, a box or an ark because that's exactly what it was. It was this box that was made and overlaid with gold. And it comes from the root word ara, which means to gather or pluck, as in the gathering crops or plucking produce from plants, such as clusters of grapes from a vine. So the Ark of the Covenant is a parallel of the Sabbath, as it is the sign of the covenant between Yahweh and Israel. Because Yahweh said, I've given my Sabbath as a sign between you and me forever. The Ark of the Covenant represented Yahweh's presence with his people. Remember when it was taken away, that's when the esteem of Yahweh left. So too do we understand that when people take away the Sabbath, they take away the esteem, the presence of Yahweh. You know, four rings in its four corners and two poles. The number four represents the four corners of the earth. This is not a physiological thing. This is a poetic statement. Okay, what it represents is the fullness of, the boundaries, whichever way you want it. I'm not getting into debate of flat, round, oblong, whatever. It's about the fullness, the completion. Okay, And we shouldn't make theologies based on this, on the shape of the earth. It's representing that it's the fullness. And we must stick just with that and not get too complicated beyond that. Okay, And so Yahweh says through Yeshayahu 11 verse 12 that he'll raise a banner for the nations and gather the outcasts of Israel and assemble the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. In other words, there's not going to be a place left where he has not gathered his people from. When we also understand that we are to put tzitzits on the four corners or the fringes of our garments, you know, we have garments that are round, we have garments that are different shapes, okay? We're not... Lego people, blocks, okay, so just don't get caught up and narrow-minded on four-corner as meaning a literal four-corner. It's a representation of fullness. Whether it is four corners or four fullnesses of a circle in a corner, however you want to do it, just stick with he doesn't leave any of his seed behind, okay? The poles were in the ark. They were not to be taken from the ark. Such a powerful thing. The poles were in the ark to lift the ark by so that priests would not touch the ark. What happened when they wanted to bring the ark back? When David, after 40 years of not having the ark in the presence of Israel, I mean, it was gone away for a few months, but it went to the house of Aminadav, okay, in Shemesh, Beit Shemesh, and it stayed there. King Shaul wasn't interested in the presence of Yahweh. And when David came into authority, he went to go fetch the ark, but they did it wrong the first time. Remember, Uzzah was struck. He came back. He was put in the house of Oved Edom, and for three months Yahweh blessed his house, and David then went and got it back, and he told the Levites to do it according to the Torah. Get back to the pattern. And this is a valuable lesson for us because I've done a number of messages in the past on how we bear the master's presence his way as lessons from what we learned from Uzzah and Oved Edom and David coming back, dancing with joy, you know, setting up a tabernacle of praise that would continue around the tabernacle or the, the Ark of the Covenant. For, for all time, we understand that the booth of David that's being restored in our day, that's, that's highlighted in the book of Acts, is that which David set up when he set up a tent because the dwelling place had not yet been made. Bringing the ark back, he set up a tent for it and he appointed 24 divisions of worship that would continue around the ark as a reflection of the pattern that's shown us in the heavens that we see through the visions that were given 
to Yechezkiel, Yeshiyahu, Yochanan in Revelation, where there's a consistent set apart, set apart, set apart, Yahweh El Shaddai, going with the Kerovim around the throne. Praise for Yahweh never stops. And that's the pattern that must be here on earth. And that's the booth of David that's being restored. A proper pattern that bears the master pre master's presence his correct way and not doing it our own way. So then a lid of atonement was made, the mercy seat, if you will, and it's upon this mercy seat that would be the top of the box, the ark, that would cover the ark with what was put inside the ark, and on this lid would be put the blood of the chosen goat and the blood of a bull on the Day of Atonement by the high priest where he would put it on the lid of atonement and sprinkle it on the east side and in front seven times, once a year on, on Yom Kippur. And with the commandments inside the ark and the gold symbolic of purity, it pictures us the need for man to be atoned in order to have fellowship with Yahweh. The lid of atonement comes from the root word kaporet, which means atonement, cover, coming from kafar, which means to cover or pacify or to pardon or make propitiation. Is that the right word, propitiation? Kafar, we get from this word, the root word means to smear, and we understand that a covering, we understand from this we get the word Kippur because Yom Kippur, which is the Sabbath of Sabbaths, whether it's on a Sabbath or not, is the day of coverings because it's everything that points toward the completion of the work of our master. So once we understand the pattern, we understand the pattern of service, then we begin to understand the pattern of the feasts. We go from Pesach, the slaughtering of our master, unleavened bread, root of leaven, cleanse the house, seven days we see it being prepared and on the seventh day a set apart gathering during the feast of Matzot there's the first of the first that's waved as a, as a reflection of the re a resurrection of our master and the ordination and appointment of a chosen people, a treasured possession, a set apart priesthood and even in the millennial reign we know that the tabernacle will be cleansed for seven days. Like it was, whenever the tabernacle was set up for seven days, it would be cleansed, and then from the eighth day it would begin its service. So too do we see with Matzot, in a sense, in its pattern, being that week that prepares us for service. And it's an ordination for us in the Master. And then we go all the way to Shavuot, where we are reminded that we once were not in service, now we are in service as a bride, that is to receive the covenant on her heart and guard that covenant, because when Yom Teruah comes, we're reminded of that covenant, that we have oil, that we're continually oiled, okay, guarding our lamps. And when Yom Kippur comes, the fullness of that is given as a pattern of the perfection of set-apartness made complete that we can then dwell with the master because ultimately it's always about the dwelling of Yahweh. That's what scripture is all about. So now it might, might sound like, come on, get over what you're talking about, this pattern and the dwelling place. This is what it's all about because it's who we are, you know. And only when we understand the pattern, how do we understand the pattern? By properly guarding to keep the Sabbaths and feasts of Yahweh, we begin to understand the gift of favor of our master and how we're able to draw near to him. Now, inside the ark, we're going to read Hebrews 9 later. We're told it's the golden pot that held the manna, the rod of Aharon, the tablets of the covenant, the two tablets of stone. We've spoken recently of that. It's, it's, the, it's the marriage covenant. The words that Yahweh physically spoke to the entire nation. And so two tablets written on both sides, it's Yahweh's copy and our copy, the husband and the bride, put together in one because his desire is that we are one. That's why Yeshua, when he prayed, he says, I pray that they are one as we are one. The, the, the object of Yahweh's desire is to be one with us. And that's why even with the first Adam, when he created Adam and made the woman out of man. And he said, for when she, he saw this woman, and he said, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father's house and be joined to his wife and they'll be one. Because all of scripture 
is about the message of the good news that the Creator's desire to be one with His creation is still at the heart of His desire. And so we have His Word, covenant, written on our hearts by His Spirit so that this reminds us that we are one in Him. Amen? Aaron's rod is quite clear. It represents authority. His rod was the only rod that um, blossomed with almond blossoms and showed the authority that Yahweh chose to take a dead stick and produce life in it and the life that we have in our master to be that which is always guarding his commands, keeping watch. The pot of manna, remember when anybody went and, went and got manna, it was for that day, except on the sixth day you got for Shabbat as well. But whenever you kept the manna longer than it was necessary, it would breed worms and stink. But this pot of manna, that was kept in the ark, never, never got corrupt because it's a picture of the bread of heaven, the life of our master that never fades because he who is the bread of heaven or bread from heaven that came to give us life and unless we eat of him, we have no part in him, we understand the life that's in him that's forever and the promise that's given in one of the assemblies in Chazan to those who overcome will be given of the hidden manna. It's a representation again of this that is a reflection of the fullness of the revelation made clear that we will be one with him. You know? So when we also look in the design, so we've gone now from the Ark of the Covenant, then we come out and we look still in the set-apart place or the dwelling place, because you have the tabernacle and you have the dwelling place in the tabernacle if in, in, in its design. Then you have the showbread table. The showbread table, remember when you read this, sometimes we, we just think again, gee whiz, I forgot about all the ladles and the spoons and the jars and the pouring and all this. I mean, there was a lot that was made that would be part of the showbread table or part of the slaughter place of incense or be part of the bronze laver, the jars. So you had all these things that were made and teaches us that there is no part in the tabernacle that's worthless. There are parts there that all have value in its service. And without each part, it cannot function correctly. And that teaches us about the gifts that we've been given in the master that must come together with a generous heart to contribute to the proper service of the pattern of dwelling in unity in the spirit of our master. So when we also understand the wonderful picture that the showbread teaches us, we understand that it teaches us when 12 new loaves were put up in order, six in a row and six in another row. We understand this is a picture again how we are one bread, but we are many. And we all partake of the one bread because we're all coming to the same table. And so we're one bread, but many parts. And we submit to one ruler. And then we look at the menorah. There's so much that we can expand on in the menorah, but I'll just run briefly through it. The menorah had a base and a shaft, and it had six branches attached to it, three coming out of one side, three out of the other side. Each branch had three almond flowers on it. And then um, the main center shaft, you'd also have four almond flowers. So when you calculate the almond flowers that were put on the menorah, there were 22. So it teaches us a valuable lesson because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So that from the Aleph to the Tav, his word is what gives light to our lives, to be in fellowship with the master. We also understand that the oils, as we said, came from crushing and the lamp had to burn continually. So that's why it was necessary to trim the lamp day and night, because when you don't trim a lamp, eventually it will go out. Even if there's oil in it, you have to keep the wick clean enough to keep burning. When our master said in Yochanan 8 verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. By following him means that we do as he did and do as he instructs and follow his pattern so that we guard his commands, his Sabbaths, his feast, because then we will always possess the light of life. You know, a lot of people think, that they are unable to keep the Sabbath because if they, if, they, if they miss out on their work or miss out on this, you know, they're not going to live. They're not going to survive. No, without this, you have no life. 
But when you possess the commands, and possession entails a proper observance of them, you possess life and life abundantly. The menorah pictures for us the word as we see that the word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. The light is for those in the house, our master teaches in a parable. We're in the house right now on his appointment where he is and he asks us to show up. And when we follow that pattern, we get light that we know now how to walk out in a dark world when we go into the rest of the week. The seven lights of the menorah also picture for us the seven appointed times of our master. And I just want to highlight, some people have skewed the things again. First fruits is Shavuot. First fruits is not during Matzot. The waving of the Omer of the first is during Matzot because that secures the ability to understand the first that's brought at Shavuot. Just a small little thing that sometimes somebody's lamp is a little bit out in that regard. You know, so we need to understand the seven feasts of our master are clearly portrayed through that. And you can look more at a message that I've done in the past, you know, um, the, the understanding of menorah, lessons in the menorah, where we also look at the seven assemblies and the seven feasts and looking at everything that we see, because the pattern of our master's service teaches us a valuable lesson about now, as children of light, walking in the light and no longer walking in darkness, we have revelation knowledge. We should be growing in that revelation knowledge. We shouldn't be groping around in the dark, not knowing who we are, who we serve, or where we're headed to. Amen? So part of the duty of Aharon, as I said, was to trim the lamps. We are to meditate on the Torah day and night. This instruction is clearly given in Bimit Bar 8. And the third piece of furniture in the set-apart place was the slaughter place of incense, and we're going to look at that next week. And next week I'll describe why it's only mentioned last. Because as we're going out, it's like some people think, okay, we've gone from the ark, showbread, menorah, and then we jump out to the slaughter place and the laver, and next week we get to the incense slaughter place. It's for good reason, because once everything's in place, intercession and service can actually now be done. So there's there's... There's reason for these instructions being given to us in this order to teach us valuable lessons of not being out of sync with the design of our master. Keeping Shabbat as a community is vital for the life of the body of our master. He causes his name to be remembered where he says, and when we come there, we are embracing this remembrance and being equipped to take the light of our master to the nations. Now, in ancient time, a lamp, primarily a vessel with a wick, a burning liquid to produce light, one would walk with a lamp showing their way. Because if you don't, and there isn't street lights like today, or there, you know, you, you would, you'd kind of have difficulty. Our master says we are a light of this world. It's impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they set it on a lampstand so it shines for all those in the house. And so therefore we understand we are to let our light shine. Light represents knowledge as opposed to ignorance of darkness. We are to let our light shine before others. We are to let whose pattern we are observing be seen in our lives. And the Greek word for lamp in Matthew 5 is luchnos, and it corresponds to the Hebrew word for ner, for lamp, for, which is ner. And in the pictographic, ner is pictured as the life in the head, because it's a nun, which is a picture of a sprouting seed. It represents continuation or life. And the reish is the head of a man, which represents chief, head, captain. Our master is our head. So we have life in the head. When you aren't guarding the commands of our master, you have no life. I've just given a long summary of this chapter, and for good reason, because everything else then begins to flow. But this is the foundation of these ingredients, as we called them earlier. Because if we are the loaf of Messiah, because we're one bread, we need good ingredients. I mean, 
and perfect ingredients according to his design. So all of these materials, ingredients, whichever way you like to picture them in your head, is valuable for us in being the set-apart bride of Messiah that is able to draw near to him and have intimacy with him on his appointments as a cyclical pattern holding firm the promise that we have where we won't just have appointments with him, he will be dwelling in our midst forever. Amen? Okay, any thoughts on this before we jump to 26? Who'd like to read chapter 26? Jackie's clearing her throat there. <clears throat> And make the dwelling place with ten curtains and fine woven linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. Make them with cherubim, the work of a skilled workman. The length of each curtain is twenty-eight cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits, all the curtains having one measure. Five curtains are joined to each other and five curtains are joined to each other. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the end curtain on one set and do the same on the edge of the other end curtain of the second set. Make 50 loops in the one curtain and make 50 loops on the edge of the end curtain of the second set, the loops being opposite to each other. And you shall make 50 hooks of gold and shall join the curtains together with the hooks and the dwelling place shall be one. And you shall make curtains of goats hair for a tent over the dwelling place or goat skins over the tent of the dwelling place make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain is 30 cubits and the width of each curtain. Did you say? Uh, sorry, share the floor. No, it's goat's, it is goat's hair. Uh, for verse 7. And you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the dwelling place, make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain is 30 cubits and the width of each curtain 4 cubits, one measure for the 11 curtains. And you shall join the five curtains by themselves and the six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the six curtains at the front of the tent. And you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. And you shall make 50 bronze hooks and put the hooks into the loops and join the tent together and it shall be one. And the overlapping part of the rest of the curtains of the tent the half curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the dwelling place and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtain of the tent is to hang over the sides of the dwelling place on this side and on that side to cover it and you shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of fine leather above that and for the dwelling place you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing up Ten cubits is the length of a board, and a cubit and a half, the width of each board. Two tenons on each board for binding one to another. Do the same for all the boards of the dwelling place. And you shall make the boards for the dwelling place, twenty boards for the south side, and make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the dwelling place, on the north side, twenty boards. And there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. And for the extreme part of the dwelling place westward, make six boards, and make two boards for the two back corners of the dwelling place. And they are double beneath, beneath, and similarly they are complete to the top, to the one ring. And so it is for both of them; they are for the two corners. And they shall be eight board, and they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under the one board, and two sockets under the other board. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the of the side of the dwelling place, for the extreme parts westward with the middle bar in the midst of the boards going through from end to end. And overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as hold, holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the dwelling place according to the pattern which you were shown on the mountain. 
and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine wo woven linen and the work of a skilled workman made with cherubim and you shall put it on the four columns of acacia wood overlaid with gold the hooks of gold upon four sockets of silver and you shall hang the veil from the hooks and shall bring the ark of the witness there behind the veil and the veil shall make a separation for you between the set apart and the most set apart place and you shall put the lid of atonement upon the ark of the witness in the midst most set apart place and you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand opposite the table on the side of the dwelling place towards the south and put the table on the north side and you shall make a covering for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen made by a weaver and you shall make for the covering five columns of acacia wood and overlay them with gold the hooks of gold and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them okay so when we look at the tabernacle we see every detail is given with precision and when we look at some of the key points that stand out in this chapter we can see the value of this chapter is about the dwelling place. Within the tabernacle now, it's focused on the dwelling place. And we've looked at all the different materials and their significance. I just want to highlight a couple of measurements that are given in regards to the dwelling place. You know, we're, we're told that 10 fine woven linen curtains uh, with cherubim embroidered on them were to be made. Now, some people, when they read this, they say made with cherubim. The cherubim didn't come down and make the curtains. The curtains had to have cherubim embroidered on them. Why? Because the pattern we see, the cherubim that are in the heavens around the throne of Yahweh are constantly declaring his set-apartness. Ten is an interesting number. We know in Scripture ten represents a community, a quorum. It represents a full ephah basket, ten omers in a basket. We also understand that it represents for us completeness. So you've got ten linen curtains, with 100 loops of blue, 50 at each end of one set and 50 at each end of the other set. The 50 golden hooks, we understand again, teaches us a valuable lesson. 50 in scripture represents the Yovel, the release. And it also speaks of Shavuot or Pentecost, where we understand a reminder of the 10 words that were spoken at Mount Sinai and now written on the hearts of the people. So what binds us together in the release, Shavuot is not a celebration that the Torah has done away with. It's a remembrance of that we, be, we have now this Torah in our hearts. And the fine linen that we are to be dressed in as representative of the dwelling that we are can only be done in perfection according to the revelation of release that we've been given in the master to obey his commands, you know. And so there were five curtains on each side that would be attached, symbolizing, so you have five curtains on one side, five curtains on the other side, and you've got all the loop-de-loops happening there and, you know, being bound together, the gold loops. And, and it's a picture again of the five and five coming together. It's almost like two hands of five fingers coming together, you know, being made one. And it represents a unity and hands, which we know in Scripture, give a reference to what one does or what one works. We can see here that the, the, these fine linen curtains are a representation of the work of skilled workmen because it was to be made according to the work of a skilled workman. And so Timotheus to Shaul writes to him and says, do your utmost to present yourself approved to Elohim, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So in other words, we can make sure that what is in our hands is perfection of set of partners because we are putting our hands to the plow and not looking back. And I mean, I'm using various imagery here, but to highlight what it represents to us as the dwelling place. If we're not doing the Torah as well as hearing it, because you can't do it if you're not hearing it, we can't be in unity. Five also represents the five books of Moshe, the Torah of Moshe. 
It also highlights again a picture of the maturity that we are brought up in according to that which our masters appointed in Ephesians. We are told he gave some to be emissaries, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. That's it. Many call it the fivefold ministry, whatever you want to call it. It's a representation of the application of the Torah of Moshe by the appointment of that which our master's given to mature the body to a position of lacking naught and not being blown about by every wind of teaching and unsure and insecure. So we understand again that when you look a little further, the covering for the dwelling place had to be bigger than the fine linen. So the covering over that of the goat's hair also now had to be a little bit bigger, but it was 11 curtains and that would go over the back of the, the dwelling place as an extra covering. And 11 sounds like an odd number. But there's a valuable lesson that we see in, in this, you know. Um, our, our master has brought a restoration to that which was disrupted. And that's what Shavuot represents for us. We think of how there were only 11 emissaries left at the Pesach meal due to Yehuda from Kirioth leaving and betraying the master. And shows how with his dwelling place, sin had been removed because when he, part of that removal of sin was Yehuda leaving that evening and then him taking the sour wine on the stake and saying it's finished. So there's a, there's a picture here where we understand that. And with Yehuda being removed, we also see at Yom Kippur with that goat that's taken into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. It's the removal of sin. You know, so the, over the goat's hair curtains was a covering of ram skin and then over that was fine leather. So when we look at this dwelling place, we also understand wonderful lessons because we, we see you've got the fine linen represents the righteousness of the set-apart ones. You've got the, the covering of the goat's hair curtains, like maybe like a type of a mohair curtain, if you will. That's a picture of a removal that our master has removed from us to bring unity. Then you've got the ram skins, or, um, which dyed red represents substitutionary sacrifice that we've already spoken of. Then you've got the fine leather, which would be the outer covering, which is to the world, the appearance may seem boring, but to us, it represents complete covering and protection. You know, the acacia wood, as we spoke about standing up, we also see that every board had the same measurement, the requirement showing us that we stand in the master, we have to be in unity. And they stood on 40 sockets of silver. 40, we all know, is a unique number in Scripture. 40 years in the wilderness, a trying time to test who could enter in. Our master was 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, just as Moshe was 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with the master twice. So our master, after his resurrection, was 40 days with his taught ones before he ascended. So it teaches us a valuable lesson of being built up in the master in complete separation as living stones. Now, the Greek word that's translated as built up when Kepha says we're being built up is oikodomio. And it means a build, to build a house, to strengthen or to edify. So then we understand how we are to be lifting each other up in the master, not breaking each other down. And it comes... Oikodomio comes from oikos, which means a house or a dwelling, and doma, which means to build a house or a dwelling. So you're building the house. It's a living word. And when we look at all the boards and everything that was put together and there were the five bars that were put through, we understand that this is a picture again of being connected by our master that holds everything together. That's a picture of his spirit that knits us in unity. We are that dwelling place. And in Tehillah 127 verse 1, we're reminded that if Yahweh does not build the house, its builders have labored in vain. 127 verse 1, did I say? Oh, sorry. Mishle 24 verse 3 to 4 says, By wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now, when we think of this tabernacle, I reminded you of all the extra bits and pieces, the ladles, the spoons, the cups, the jars. That's all the present or pleasant and pre 
precious and pleasant riches. It represents everything, you know. So when we see the clear instructions given for the tabernacle, Shaul speaks of that which we have been built up and proven by, by fire in his letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, no one is able to lay any other foundation except that which is laid, which is Yeshua Messiah. And if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work shall be revealed. For the day shall show it up because it is revealed by fire. And the fire shall prove the work of each one what sort it is. If anyone's work remains which he has built on, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he shall suffer loss. He shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, but so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a dwelling place of Elohim, and the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? If anyone destroys the dwelling place of Elohim, Elohim shall destroy him. For the dwelling place of Elohim is set apart, which you are. Now, understanding these words, it makes perfect sense. The foundation is laid. Yeshua Messiah is our righteous high priest and king forever. Righteousness and right ruling are the foundation of his throne, justice. That's the foundation. His Torah has been set. It's non-negotiable. And therefore, as we build all these parts in the tabernacle, the pattern, we're going to be, we're tested and tried. Are we doing according to the pattern? And therefore, we must make sure that the foundation is not going to change. It's Messiah and his way, his Torah. And when the day comes to be proven, it will be seen, did your life produce a obedience to the pattern and obedience to the pattern? Or have you brought in other ways? And so we are refined through the fire of our master. And when you look at all the, the dwelling place and its pattern, we see a wonderful celebration that's given to us of the praise for Yahweh's dwelling place, where David says in Tehillah or Psalm 84, verse 1 to 2, he says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts. My being has longed and even fainted for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living El. Can you hear the heart of the psalmist here, of David? The basic outline, this was a praise for the dwelling place of Yahweh and his longing to be in Yahweh's presence. How do you long to be in Yahweh's presence together on his Sabbaths and feasts? Think about that. The basic outline of Tehillah 84, it opens with praise for the dwelling place of Yahweh and those who live there. Praise and blessing is expressed by this faithful sojourner who comes to the dwelling place. We see that in verses 5 to 7 as you go through it. You can be reminded of this dwelling place pattern that we're looking at. And following these blessings and praise, a prayer for the sovereign is given and the desire to be anywhere else is greatly overshadowed and diminished by the awesome blessing of being in the dwelling place of Elohim. Elohim is praised as being the only true source of joy the source of strength, the source of security, and the blessing upon those who trust in Elohim is greatly affirmed in this psalm. It's such a wonderful psalm. I mean, it really is, and I encourage you to go look at it and, and dig into it because one of the things that we must ask ourselves when thinking about this is how, you know, when, when he says, how lovely are your dwelling places, the Hebrew word that's used here for how lovely or lovely is yedidos. And it can, it's the plural of the word yadid, which means beloved, lovely, well-loved or well-beloved. And the basic meaning of this noun is one greatly loved by Elohim and not man. So we understand with David being the beloved, it's one that Yahweh truly expressed a love for, you know, and so when we consider this deep expression of love for the dwelling place of Elohim, we should ask ourselves, because the dwelling place entails a proper Sabbath and feast observance. How much do you love the Sabbaths and appointed times of Yahweh? We're sitting here right now. Are you like those in the days of, of Amos? Oh, when will it be over so we can start trading? 
Or do you not want the Sabbath to end like the days of Shoal where they were carrying on after Sabbath all the way to midnight and guys were falling out of the windows and being revived? And, you know, how much do you love Yahweh's dwelling place, his appointments? If your heart loves the dwelling places as this psalmist declares, then missing an appointed time is out of the question. It's not a negotiable matter. It's not even a thought. As love for his presence will cause you to make sure that his appointments will never be missed. So many people often find excuses why they can't be gathered. Just simply highlights that their love for Elohim is not as fervent as they would like it to be or think or claim it to be. And it comes back to what we said right in the beginning. It has to come from a heart that is moved. Amen. So that's the dwelling place. Let's close this Torah portion with 27 verse 1 to 18. Who'd like to read that? Looking at the, the slaughter place and the offerings that are brought there. Kayla. And you shall make a slaughter place of acacia wood. Five cubits long and five cubits wide, the slaughter place is square, and its height three cubits. And you shall make its horns on its four corners, its horns are of the same size, are of the same, and you shall overlay it with bronze, and you shall make its pots to receive its ashes, and its shovels, and its basins, and its forks, and its fire holders. Make all its utensils of bronze, and you shall make a grating for it, a bronze network, and shall make on the network four bronze rings at its four corners and shall put it under the rim of the slaughter place beneath, so that the network is halfway up the slaughter place. And you shall make poles for the slaughter place, poles of acacia wood, and shall overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be on the two sides of the slaughter place, for lifting it. Make it hollow with boards, as it was shown to you on the mountain, so they are to make it. And you shall make the courtyard of the dwelling place. For the south side screens for the courtyard made of fine woven linen, 100 cubits long for one side, and its 20 columns and their 20 sockets of bronze, the hooks of the columns and the bands of silver. And so for the north side in length, screens 100 cubits long, with its 20 columns and their 20 sockets of bronze, and the hooks of the columns and their bands of silver. And the width of the courtyard on the west side screens of 50 cubits, with their 10 columns and their 10 sockets. And the width of and the width of the courtyard on the east side, 50 cubits, and the screens on one side of the gate, 15 cubits, with their three columns and their three sockets, and on the other side, screens of 15 cubits, with their three columns and their three sockets, and for the gate of the courtyard, a covering 20 cubits long, of blue and purple and scarlet material, and woven linen made by a weaver, four columns and four sockets. All the columns around the courtyard have bands of silver, the hooks silver and their sockets bronze. The length of the courtyard is 100 cubits and the width 50 by 50 and the height 5 cubits, woven of fine linen thread and its sockets of bronze. All the utensils of the dwelling place for all its service, all its pegs and all the pegs of the courtyard are bronze. Okay, so now we've moved out of the dwelling place and we come to a very significant part of the tabernacle, and that is the bronze slaughter place, where this was the place for burning animals in offerings to Yahweh. As we understand from Vaikra, offerings as, or sacrifices is that which is korban, it's the ability to draw near. Now, it showed that the Israelites, the first step for sinful man to approach a set-apart Elohim was to be cleansed by the blood of an innocent animal. That was the pattern of the dwelling place. For a sin offering, a man had to, a person had to bring an animal, and it had to be a male without defect, the animal that is, and, <laughs> you know, either from the flock or from the herd, and it was brought to the priest at the tabernacle gate. And when he laid his hand on the head of the offering, the person was identifying with the sacrifice. His sin and guilt, it, as a picture of confession, was now being put on the responsibility now, saying, this animal is going to be offered on my behalf. And the priest would then, well, the person slaughters the animal, then the priest would take the animal and present it on the slaughter place. Blood is significant for atonement. 
and for cleansing. Vaikra 17 verse 11 says, For life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the slaughter place to make atonement for you, for your lives, for it is the blood that makes atonement for your life. So here we see without the slaughter place in this pattern, we can never fully understand the blood of Messiah. And in Hebrews 9, it says, according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So although this was done each year as a covering for their sins, Israel had to perform these duties every year as the blood of bulls and goats could never remove the sin. They were, however, a covering that would remove sin or cover them for their sin until the time of the coming good matters would set everything in order by the blood of Messiah. The bronze slaughter place represents the fullness of the sacrifice of our master laying down his own life. Horns on the slaughter place are a symbol of power. The Hebrew word for horn, keren, means it represents power or might and it beautifies. The, a horn on an animal is what beautifies the animal. So the horns on the slaughter place is the strength of the slaughter place. It represents the beauty and the significance. So when we look upon our master and his sacrifice, we see what he's done for us in the celebration of the strength that we now have in him to also lay down our lives as a living sacrifice, never neglecting what the slaughter place represents for us so that we can live our li life the way it should, shining the light as true set-apart ones. We also understand that the grating or meshwork would be used as a sieve so that it would stop bones from falling through as they would be burnt up correctly or full, and then the ashes would just be taken out. So this is a powerful picture because we understand that even as our master is sifting the nations, not one seed will fall to the ground. Those that are in the master are preserved in him. And the poles are again made to carry the slaughter place, once again, just like the Ark of the Covenant and the showbread table. All of these things that, where poles were used teaches us a valuable lesson of guarding the presence of our master and carrying his word his way. And the slaughter place and the poles carrying that of bronze teaches us how we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to help one another. We are to encourage one another. We are to reprove one another, build each other up. You know, and then when we look at the fence and the gate that's in the closing portion of this, we understand, as I said, it represents entrance. Coming to our master, he is the entrance. He is the door for the sheep. And we understand the fence is representing the entire, got a picture for a moment, two million plus people dwelling in tents. I'm not sure if everybody's tent was as sparkling white as the tabernacle was. But they may have had just your, you know, a lot of maybe leather tents that were there because it would be simple and from a distance, oh, here's two million plus people. Here's, gee whiz, here's a, almost, almost look a little bit um, like a, what do you get these camps where a refugee camp maybe, like when you get this picture of a, in a, in a, ref, but a bit more orderly, I think, than some of the refugee camps. And in the midst of this, you have from a distance, you would have this tabernacle that's sparkling white fences around this and this dwelling place which has a covering over but there's a whole lot going on and there's smoke going up and there's priests running around in white garments maybe not running around but doing service can you imagine what it must look like the hot desert sun shining on these have you ever been out and looked at either a white wall or your white sheets on the on the, and you come inside and it's like oh i can't see anymore you know can you imagine how brilliant this must have been with the bronze slaughter place, the smoke that was going up, you know, the gold trimmings, everything that was, it was just awesome to look at. And when we think of this, the fence is what protected the dwelling place from being corrupted by anything outside. We also know the design of the encampments, which we're going to get to and get, look at numbers or Bamidbar. We also understand that the, the, the priests, the sons of Aharon, and how they would be around that to protect the people from drawing near to Yahweh inappropriately. But we understand that there's a good reason for this, set, this white linen fence, because as the white linen, as we've spoken, reminds us of righteousness, 
We understand the good boundaries that have been set in place for us to be built up as living stones, to make sure that that which should not be inside is not inside, and to make sure that we are not bringing in elements that corrupt the perfect design of our master. You know, we also understand that without our master, we have no entrance. When we look at all this pattern of the dwelling place and we look at the the design of coming to the gate, walking past the, the, the bronze slaughter place, coming to the laver. Next week we'll speak a bit more about the slaughter place of incense, but the showbread table, the menorah, the presence of the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil, but understanding now in our master that we have access to the throne of favor in our time of need. Everything that we've looked at today comes back to a condition of the heart. All whose hearts move them shall teruma shall bring that contribution of their lives as required. A contribution of the heart. When one's heart is moved, you know, doing his instructions is something joy-filled. When we study his tabernacle like this, and you can look at the notes for even more insight, we can see that there is no other way but to live according to his Torah. As we continue to remain in him and be built up as precious living stones in our Messiah, and when you understand this Torah portion called Teruma, then you've got to see through the mirror of the word and ask yourself as you look into that bronze mirror, as you allow the word to judge you now, how is your life reflected against this clear pattern of hearts that are moved to submit, serve, build, and contribute? You see, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12, Shaul says, If the readiness is present... It's well received according to one, what one has and not according to what he does not have. You see, a lot of people are, oh, when I, when I, when I, and they never get to that. But when the readiness is there to know, because those that say, oh, when I, then, when that happens, that readiness is suddenly lost. So it, each one has received a gift from the master. Some maybe receive more than others. That's okay. That's up to the master, not up to people. Serve one another as good trustees of the manifold favor of Elohim. So we must, 1 Chronicles 29 verse 3, it says, and this was the words of David. And this is what I want to close this week with looking at these words. Because I delighted in the house of my Elohim, I have treasure of gold and silver. I give for the house of my Elohim even more than all that I have prepared for the set apart house. In other words, I mean, David had a, a wonderfully beautiful set-apart house, you know. And, but in preparing for the temple that his son Shalomo would make, because he was not going to make it because he was a man of battle and had blood on his hands. But Yahweh said, your son will make it. And he says, I have delighted. It's more than what I've done for myself, in a sense. And the Hebrew word delighted comes from the word ratsa, which means to be pleased with, accept favorably, delight in, and approved. And now this was wonderful words, David delighting in the house. The Hebrew word that's ratsa, the equivalent that's used in the, ten, in the Septuagint, the Greek text, is sune domai. Sune domai means, again, delight, rejoice together, to rejoice in or feel satisfaction concerning so when you are truly having hearts moved, do you have a satisfaction? That's actually, or do you have a grudge? That's why he says, don't grudge. Don't, you can't. If you're going to grudge, then don't nudge. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's kind of like, but there should be a rejoicing. There should be a satisfaction. And this word, I'm, why I'm mentioning it, Shaul says in Romans 7 verse 22, for I delight in the Torah of Elohim according to the inward man. You know? Our ability to truly delight in his Torah according to the inward man equips us to walk according to the spirits. In that chapter, he says the Torah is spiritual. And this is where he's giving the image of this wrestling against flesh and spirit and what we should be doing, what our flesh wants to do in this thing and how we are able to overcome this. Thanks be to Yeshua Messiah. When we delight in his Torah, then doing his Torah is a delight. Amen. It's not a heavy burden. It's not something that's too hard. It's not like a, oh. When we delight in the truth, it's a pleasure to be doing it. And delighting in guarding the Sabbaths and feasts of Elohim 
is something that's done with satisfaction in one's heart, you know. As we consider this Torah portion, Teruma, may we all be inspired once again, encouraged by this living word, to do our utmost before our master in bringing before him as our lives a worthy contribution, being that daily living offering up to him. For this is our reasonable worship that must be done with great joy and gladness of heart. Any thoughts on this Torah portion? Any comments? Any questions? Gillian is saying the widow's tithe. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark. I'm not sure what, are you asking a question or are you making a statement? It's two ex exclamation marks. So maybe you can just... I'll give a moment. I know it's a 10-second time delay between us and the internet, but Gillian, if you could maybe expand on what you're asking there or, or, or stating. Anybody want to share while we wait to see if Gillian expands on her comment? If she doesn't expand, we'll, we'll close, but I don't want to make assumptions and answer something I'm totally off track with, so... I hope portions like this begin to excite you. It's not just a list of materials and measurements. And it, it begins when you start to, in your mind and in your heart, begin to recognize that everything here carries weight in its description of functioning as a bride, as a body of Messiah together, and how everything has its place. It's, it's so perfect, you know. Okay, she's saying, you, sh you were saying that we shouldn't wait until we have enough. Okay, I'm not sure with the widow. Oh, the widow's might. Okay, that was when the widow gave more than everybody. Okay, now I'm tying the two together. So, okay. Okay, when I was saying that we shouldn't wait till we have enough, what I mean by that is that some people procrastinate obedience or their willingness, nadav, to give as they could be giving. Because, like I said with David, his celebration of I've prepared more, I've delighted in the house of, for that which needs to be prepared for the house of Elohim more than in what I have. He, he was basically saying, yes, I have lots of, I'm, I mean, David was in a position, he, he was sovereign, he had everything. But it wasn't like, okay, I've taken care of myself first, now I'll see what I can give to Yahweh. His expression of praise for the excitement of actually being able, he would never get to see the, the temple being made but he got to be able to participate in preparation for it. That was the heart behind the matter. What I'm saying is sometimes people procrastinate obedience, whether it's tithes, giving, offerings, whatever it is, in, in doing something, even obedience to the commands. They will always say, you know, when my life gets to this point and when I've achieved this, when I've got that, that's when I'll begin to do that. Now we're saying you should begin to do what's right uh, when you should be doing it. <laughs> I think... Yes. She gave everything she had. Yes. While the, the rich guy was giving what was required. Yes. It wasn't wrong, but her heart was, I'll give everything I have. Yeah. Which is what Yahweh wants. Yeah. Yahweh wants your all. And you can't give what you don't have to give. I think maybe that's where the question's coming in, because if I don't have enough... You, if you don't have to give what's required, you can't give what's required. But when you do have and you are now holding back because you first want to, that's what the heart matter is being highlighted, maybe with the widow's might. That's, that's a good lesson for us. So it comes down to here when we're seeing this, you know, I think when we come to portions like this, because of misguided interpretations or the lack of the Torah and corrupt worship that's being done without the blue and just purple and black and whatever, you get, get the picture, what we've all came out from. A lot of times whenever we look at parts in the Torah like this and its design and this, you know, um, expression of hearts being moved, come and give, give. All the people here, sometimes all the words that people hear is give. And they hear nothing else and all they hear is give. And, 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 and sadly, that's a fleshly response 
to what should be lived out fleshly by the Spirit, if, if it makes sense. So when we look at this portion of teruma, it should stir our hearts to say, I'm part of this body. How, how, how am I actually contributing? That can be physically. It can be in gifts and talents and service. But what we also take note of here is that this is something, again, that went over and above, as I said from the beginning, what is required. In terms of that which Yahweh called for, knowing what's in their hands to say, bring this to me to build this so I can be with you, and he will never ask something of you that you're unable to give and to bring as being part of something. I don't know if you... Can you say it can be physically or can be... The gifts and talents of those should be separate. No. It should be of all of it. Yes. Physical, talents, yes. gifts. I mean, you should contribute yeah. of all of you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in a sense, I was, every time you say he's not going to ask you anything you can't give, I think of the rich man. Yes. Who, sometimes he asks you as a test to say, to see, are you willing? Yes. To even go beyond what is just the baseline, like the necessity. Yes. Because for him, it's like, I kept all the commands, which means he was giving as he should and obeying all yes. the commands. But still, he always said, okay, we'll give you all your money. Yeah. Because that was the stumbling. That was his stumbling. So that was revealing the heart. So if he's asking you something that you think you can't give, it's revealing something in your heart. Yes. Or you think you don't have. Like you say, he won't ask you something you don't have. Yes. Sometimes you're unwilling yeah. to give it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's, it's that balance of he, he will never, I mean, Yaakov says, he will never take you beyond what you can bear. So he won't ask you something that you're unable to give. But sometimes you feel like I'm unable to give. But the fact that he's asking shows that actually you are able, but what's hindering your heart? Point in saying... People wait until they have enough before they give. It's sometimes when people are struggling financially, they say they can't afford to tithe. Yeah. And therein lies the problem. Yeah. Because you will never have enough. Yeah. If you don't put your own first. Yeah. And I think this lesson of this Torah portion must teach us a valuable lesson because Teruma takes it to a deeper intimacy than baseline obedience. Teruma, as I said in the beginning, was beyond what was required with the tithes. And often people feel teruma comes before tithes, where it's not. Yahweh, we've de dealt with Yahweh's first. That's a non-negotiable. And that also has to have the same heart as a teruma, because it's always about the heart. So when we look at these things, this is... As we live this out practically, it's an expression of being incited by the recognition of Yahweh's goodness. And how do I respond to that? What, what, what do I respond? How do I esteem Yahweh? And, and we get to actually express that as our hearts are moved. Now, when it says as hearts are moved, it's not the prescribed giving that's commanded because that's fixed that's a non-negotiable whatever and at the feast whatever but when when a heart is moved it's not waiting for an appointment to do what's required it's a it's a it's a spontaneous thing and it's done according to what one has and not what one doesn't have so i think it's it really is the more that we learn about our master and the more mature we grow the more that we can see the difference between the widow and the rich man. Worldly perspective, oh, the poor widow, but she had more. She gave more. She reward, you know, the rich man, worldly perspective, he's got it all, but he had lost it all because he's got nothing. So we have to learn to recognize that whatever we have is of Yahweh's making. And are we actually... You know, just ticking the boxes like the rich man. No, I do this. I, I do everything. I do that. Okay, but are you being moved beyond that? And that's what was being questioned of the rich man. And he couldn't, his heart was not moved beyond line upon line. Where the widow, I mean, 
She just gave. I mean, that was the, there's the contrasting pictures that we get. Now, read that in as you will, because everyone is uniquely different, as the widow and the rich man were. But it's always a heart question that Yahweh is consistently trying us in and proving us in. We, one thing that we acknowledge as we grow in maturity in the Master, he's constantly checking our heart. <laughs> and we must allow him to do that, lest we become hard-hearted and find ourselves losing the joy of this kind of movement that he calls for. Does that make sense? So let's, let's just realize in Taruma we must lift our lives up in a celebration of what our master has done for us and, and express that as the, as the heart gets moved in obedience to the master. That's what it comes down to. So... What a wonderful Torah portion to begin our journey while we're already into Shemot and 25 chapters already. But looking at this design, we've been through the wilderness. They've got the covenant. Now it's about having Yahweh with us. You see, we can learn a lot of rules about what the, the covenant is. But now it's how do I keep Yahweh here? <laughs> how do I keep him with me? I don't want to lose him. And that was what David's heart was about. I, I just I don't want to lose you. How Your dwelling place is better than anything. Am I showing that just, am I just speaking it or am I showing it by my life? Okay, so let's have lunch. We've gone a little bit over time, but that's okay. We're delighting in the master's table. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless and praise you and thank you for your Torah that sets us apart, that gives us a pattern by which we are to live. And beginning this week and continuing next week, we're going to continue looking at the wonderful pattern that you've given us as one that we must recognize is a, a good thing to be part of, a good thing to be learning in. Uh, it's a pattern that teaches us what true joy in the set-apart spirit is. And I pray that you would continue to bring maturity to our hearts and minds, that we are not like the world and the nations that are stubborn or the religious Pharisees that are stubbornly hard-hearted against your commands, but rather that we can be people that are like David and proclaiming a delight for you in your dwelling place and the desire just to have you in our midst completely forever. It requires our hearts, and that we can give you because you've bought us at a price. And we thank you that even as we partake in the showbread table today, may it carry even more significance based on what we've learned through this pattern of what the showbread represents for us in the set-apart place on your appointed times. We thank you that you continue to strengthen us in your truth and we bless you and praise you, not just words on our lips, but we want our light to shine continually and be your fragrance. So we thank you for being able to share in a meal together, for your provision, your protection. And we bless you and praise you in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Amen and amen.